You and I don't know what that destiny is, but you and I have a destiny. Now, God will reveal to us what that destiny is, but readily, just, just when you wake up in the morning, when you're just alive, you might not know what it is. So here's what God will do. Because your destiny is so important, he will not allow us to miss it. So what he will do is intentionally allow things to happen to lay hold on us to bring us to where he wants us to be. I will walk in and exemplify the spirit of victory. That you gotta, you gotta make that confession. We have the spirit of victory. That means that you, here's, here's what you gotta start doing. That means you gotta start commanding everything around you to look like what you have. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Morning Manor. I'm James Nelson here, the pastor at Destiny Christian Church, and I want to welcome you. Can you believe the last Sunday of May, Memorial Weekend? And uh, we're just blessed to be able to share with you, be with you, uh, to be alive, and to just have this moment. Uh, you know my testimony. It's in him I live. It's in him I move. It's in him I have my being. And the reality is this is the day that the Lord has made. We are rejoicing and we are glad in it. And I'm grateful to the Lord that you have joined us today. Will you please be so kind and like, comment, tag, and share? We, we want to be interactive. Let somebody know that we're on. Tag somebody. Because I'm telling you, you don't hear me say this every week. But I have a word for you today. Well, let me say, the Lord has a word for you today. 
And I believe that you're going to be blessed. Let's do this. While you're coming in, letting us know what country, province, wherever you're worshiping from, will you join me with a word of prayer? And then we're going to go. Listen, I know it's Memorial Day weekend, Sunday. Just give me a little bit of time. You can go party, have some fun. But let's give God this hour or less. Father, I thank you for it's in you we live and move and have our being. I thank you because you do all things well. You make no mistakes. You are absolutely perfect in all of your ways. I honor you because you're our Lord, you're our King, and you're our God. I thank you because you have awakened us this morning. You started us on our way. I thank you that we have our right minds. We have activity of limb. I thank you because you are with us. Today, Lord, we come against and we bind every power that's not like you. We release everything that is you. I pray today for your favor today. I pray for favor today. Lord, I don't always sense to pray for that, but I pray for favor today. Let favor, supernatural favor, hit your people, hit the lives of your people. Penetrate, overtake us now in the name of Jesus. Cause your power to be with us. Let your power fall. Lord, we call on you tonight, today rather. We, we call on you even in this moment, and we ask that you would talk to us. We do not come arrogantly. We humble ourselves, for you told us that we can come boldly to the throne of grace to ask for grace and mercy to help. So we humble ourselves now, but we ask boldly for grace and mercy. We know it's of the Lord's mercy that we're not consumed. Your compassions fail not. They're renewed every morning. We thank you. Glory. Hallelujah. We thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for your favor, your grace, your mercy. Kind Father, I ask that you would be with us today. Let your glory fill the room where I am. Let it fill the room where they are, Lord. Let us feel you together. Let, let us be impacted today. I speak life and strength and health. Breakthrough. We lift up this country as we continue to heal. Help us, Lord. Help us, help us, help us. But we thank you that you're sending help from your sanctuary. Now, Lord, as you minister to us today, we're going to give you glory and praise. Forgive us, Lord, I ask for anything and everything that we've done We recognize, Lord, that we don't always get it right. I know we do say and think some things that we should not. Hallelujah. I confess, I ask that you would forgive us, apply the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and count us worthy. Now, Lord, if you would be with this moment, if you would talk to us, if you would help us, if you would direct us, I'm open and available that I may say what you have purposed for today to be said. I thank you that victory is going to be experienced. I thank you that deliverance is going to come. Hey, Shai, glory to God. I thank you that life, I speak life today. I speak life, life provision and peace. Life provision and peace in Jesus' name. Now, bless this moment. I know in my tongue that it would be of a pen of a ready writer, my eyes and ears, to only hear, see, and say what you purpose for this moment. In Jesus' name, and we say amen. Listen, don't have a whole lot of fluff today. Only thing that I need to remind you of is Saturday. Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday, and we have our Saturday worship experience, 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. 5.30 prayer, 6 o'clock. Listen, I'm telling you. God is going to meet us. He's been faithful. Dr. Valerie Moore was with us. God showed up. But I'm looking for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This week, I'm asking some of you to intentionally fast a day or two along with me. And let's believe for an outpouring. I'm believing that those that are seeking to be spirit-filled, that they are filled with Holy Spirit. Those that need a rebirth. The Bible says in Acts 4, when they prayed, they were filled again. I believe God's going to do something this weekend. You have family members that are seeking God? Bring them. Bring them. I believe God's going to minister to us signs and wonders and miracles. And we're believing God for it in Jesus' name. Listen, 
this is an opportunity for you to sow seed. I want you to, to understand this. Everything starts with a seed. Do you not know that Jesus himself was considered a seed? Seed of Abraham. And that seed shifted everything. But the seed could not bring a harvest until it was sown. John 12 tells us, except the seed fall into the ground, it abideth alone. It will never produce anything. But when it falls into the ground and dies, it produces a harvest. So when you give, when you press send, what you're really doing is sowing a seed. And the crazy part is you don't know what the seed that you sow today is going to do. You don't know the return that God has for you. He's getting ready to blow your mind. You heard me pray for favor today because that's what I sensed. I sense God releasing favor. And see, when you pray in the Holy Ghost, you pray according to the will of God. And based upon God's will, he wants to release favor today. The seed that you're sowing is going to release favor. Glory to God. A supernatural favor. Doors are about to open. No's are about to be turned into yes. Denial is about to be turned into approval. There's about to be return on investment. God's getting ready to do something. Debts are about to be canceled. I'm telling you, just as sure as I'm sitting here, standing really, but just as sure as I'm standing here, something is about to break. That's why we sow seed. So today I'm not giving you the normal pill, help us feed the hunger, help us do this, help us. No, I want you to plant your seed in the ground. This is good ground. Cash App, JN Ministries, GiveLify, Destiny Christian Church. Text to give, 34444, and, and put in the comment section, give DCC. Now, God's going to tell you what the amount. Some of you, you've already been instructed. You've been a little disobedient. But today, there's no time like the present to get it right. I want you to get that seed in the ground in Jesus' name. Tithing is what we give to God. It's what is required. 10%. It's fixed. But that offering is the seed. And what happens is, read Malachi chapter number 3. The tithing is what guards the seed, and it's what protects the harvest. And it beats back and cuts off and it rebukes the devourer that wants to come and destroy the harvest that your seed is about to give you. Glory to God. That's why we tithe. That's why we trust him. That's why we prove him. So, Father, thank you today for every person right now that's about to tithe, that's getting ready to sow a seed, that's going to honor you now with their treasure, with that money, with that seed. Thank you that as they are obedient to the amount that you tell them to give, I thank you, Father, that harvest is coming. Lord, some would do a $200 seed, some would do a $50 seed, because there's some, Lord, that still didn't do that $220 seed from a couple of weeks ago. But, Lord, I want you to speak now and thank you that as they plant the seed, harvest comes. And I thank you that the favor is going to make the seed produce as you call it to produce. In Jesus' name, and we say amen. I know there's so much going on in the world, but I believe that this word that I'm getting ready to share with you is going to be one that's going to help give you counsel, inspiration for what's getting ready to take place. Second Kings chapter number 7 is where I want to go. I only have three verses, beginning at verse number three, and we're going to go to verse number five. I want you to open your hearts and your spirits. Listen to what it says. It says, now, there were four leprous men at the entrance to the gate. They said to one another, why sit we here? Why are we sitting here until we die? If we say, let us enter into the city, it says, the famine is in the city. We shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. So come now and let us go over to the camp of the Syrians. If they spare our lives, we shall live. They kill us, we shall 
but die. I, I know the reading is a little different, the English Standard Version, King James Version, but, but you can follow along. So they arose at twilight. Do y'all see this? To go to the camp of the Syrians. But when they will come to the edge of the camp, there was no one there. I, I want to I preach this message today that's actually near to me. And, it, and it's simply this message. I decided to fight. That's what I want to preach today. I decided to fight. I, I, I know I haven't actually do this in a while, but I need you to put it in the comments. I need you to put it in the comments and, and just, just put it in there. I decided to fight. I'm not going to take this sitting down. I, I'm not going to just allow this to go. I, I'm not going to just sit back and take this. Not, not for my children, not for my home, not for our school system. Listen, we know all the activities and the shooting and stuff. This happened this week. I'm not going to sit down and take it. I have decided to fight. I, I'm, I'm going to fight against poverty. I'm going to fight against racism. I'm going to fight against peer pressure. I'm going to fight against the trouble that I'm having. I'm going to fight against what's happening with my children. I have decide. I'm going to fight for my relationship. I'm going to fight for my marriage. I'm going to fight for my career. I'm going to fight for my sanity. I'm going to fight for my life. I have decided to fight. If I don't say nothing else, I've already preached a message right there. I decided to fight. Earlier this week, watching the news, I saw something that I thought was very interesting. There was an attempted robbery of a jewelry store in California. And I thought it was quite interesting because I, I used the word attempted. It looked like a group of teens came in and if you've been watching, there's this wave where they come in in rushes and grab quickly and run out. But something was different about this particular attempt. This attempt didn't happen because when they came in and they broke the first glass, the employees of the store thwarted this attempt by fighting back. It was interesting because two of the employees were brother and sister. One employee came from somewhere. We don't know where she came from, picked up a chair to throw it and hit him. And those three or four teenagers that came in thought that they were going to get some fine jewelry were greatly disappointed because the employees decided to fight back. They determined that their job, what they were watching and protecting, was more valuable than just standing around and doing nothing. They looked at the value of what they were doing. And then I, but I also believe it was principle. You're not going to come in here and think you're just going to take and rob what everybody else has to work hard for and come in and buy and earn. They decided to fight. So much so that it made the news. I, I want you to get this now. I want you to get this. Making the decision to fight comes from a place of two things. One value and principle, value and principle. Now, come, come a little closer because I, I won't be long. I, I won't be long. I need you to get this. Value and principle. 
Sometimes it's a mixture of both. Sometimes it's and or. But the reality of it is when I value something and I feel like that there is worth there, I fight for it. Whether it's a relationship, a marriage, whether it's a career, whether it's something with ministry, whether it's an opportunity, when you see value, you fight. But on the other hand, sometimes it's a matter of principle. See, see when, when, we, when we talk about principle, I, I need us to understand this because you hear me talk about it a lot. Some things is not even about the thing itself. Some things are about the principle of it. When, when I say the principle of it, I'm talking about the, the fundamental um, truth of it. I'm, I'm talking about um, the value, again, here's that word, a value that I've placed on something. I'm talking about a belief, a rule, a, a conviction by which we live. So, so if you understand this then, then you understand that when I say it's an issue of principle, I'm talking about what I value. I'm talking about what it is that I believe in. When I have a principle about something, I will fight because of the principle. All right, here's a prime example. Have you ever gone to the store and you've paid cash and then when they give you your money back, your change is wrong? It could be a dollar. It could be 50 cent. And then when you bring it to the person's attention and they argue with you that you're wrong, the reason why you go back and forth, and, and not being unseemly, but sometimes it's the principle. If my change is supposed to be a dollar and 50 cent, don't just give me 50 cent. Give me my dollar along with my 50 cent. Now, sometimes we let stuff slide, but sometimes it's about making an awareness because of the principle. Sometimes it's not what is done to you, but it's the principle behind why they did it. Because I'm not really upset as much as what was done, but the principle behind it. That you felt like you had the audacity, the right, the mitigated goal to be able to do that. So we fight for either value or we fight for principle. We're in a, we're in a story today that, that is one that is based upon a little bit of both, but more value than anything. First thing you got to understand that I think is so important to give us understanding of when 2 Kings and there's a famine that has happened. Now, let me give you a backdrop of this. In order to understand this, <laughs> Elisha is, is the prophet now, the protege of Elijah, called from his family and brought into, after his apprenticeship, he became the master prophet. Being a prophet of God, God says, I won't do anything unless I reveal to my prophets first. And the Bible says that the king of Syria, Benad, Benadad, was trying to get Israel. But the Bible says every time he tried, the prophet Elisha would warn the king. And it got to the point where the king of Syria started asking his king, he said, all right, listen, somebody is 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 leaking information there's a breach here Some, somebody is is talking too much and 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 the servant said to the king king there, there's no treason here there's there's nobody turned against you he said there's a prophet because god will let you know the plan of the enemy god will give you heads up god will put something in your spirit watch out for this person 
Don't, don't do that. Don't sign that contract. <laughs> don't, don't, don't engage in there. Don't go into there. The, 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 there there's a warning. There, there are some things that God will put in your spirit. Why am I talking about this? Because I need you to understand, everyone that's looking at me, everyone that's listening, I need you to hear me, that God will look out for you. The Bible says the king gets so mad, and then they try to capture Elisha. Y'all heard the story where he took his whole army and he surrounded the city. And the Bible says that Elijah evaded him again. And the Bible says this time their eyes were blinded. And this is where we get the famous saying, there's more with us than it is with them. Oh, yeah, this is, this is, this is, this is the, all the context behind chapter number 7. And so the king says, fine, I can't get Elisha, the horses of chariots surround the city. There's more, and Elijah leads them away, away from the city. The king says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to besiege the whole city, and I'm going to cut off their supply. While nobody can get in, but here's what also can happen. Can't nothing get out. Or rather, while nothing can get out, nothing can get in. But also that meant no food. So eventually because there is nothing coming in, famine takes place. Oh, I'm getting ready to go somewhere. Sometimes you got to get this. Famine many times was a method that God used at times for judgment and correction. The famine, God would use it in order to get the attention of people to cause them to a place of correction. Like David, when Saul made a pact and mishandled a covenant, the Bible says, with an, a Gentile group, the Bible says that God sent the famine and David, with Shechem, I believe it was, and David has to figure out why is the famine. And when he realizes because of what Saul did, David did what was necessary, offered up the sons of those that had done wrong, and the famine ceased. But the famine sometimes is also a tactic of the enemy. Famine is a tactic of the enemy to try and break you and bully you into submission. Famine happens, I want y'all to see this, when what you have runs out and there's nothing else coming in. I want to talk to some people today who are dealing with famine. Because you've used up everything that you have and there's nothing coming in. See, we live off of the system of reciprocity. Even the earth, the earth works off of reciprocity. Leaves that fall to the ground disintegrate and they become source and, and, and food for the ground to give back. It's a, it's, a, it's a recycling. So the earth produces, but that which goes into the ground feeds the ground and calls the ground to give back again. And then the ground is fed and it feeds again. See, you and I are people that are built on reciprocity. Because when you give, 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 it has to be replenished or there's nothing else to give. And famine happens when there's nothing coming back. I want to talk to some people that's been in famine. Famine in finances. Famine even in your faith. Famine in your marriage, in your relationship, in your interaction with people. Famine in your ministry. Famine 
in the area of love. Famine. Because you're a giver and you give and you support and you do and it's not giving back. Famine. The barrel is running out and because there's nothing returning, you're dealing with a famine. I have good news for you because the famine got so severe that mothers were eating their children. Lord have mercy. Glory to God. This, this famine was so severe that they were eating donkeys' heads and doves' dung. Famine will drive you to a place of desperation. I, I want to talk to the person that are that are doing desperate things. You're not a bad person. You're just trying to survive. You're just trying to make it. I, I'm not condoning infidelity or anything of that nature in relationships, whether it's marriage or or friendships or dating or whatever. I, I'm not. I'm not condoning it. But but. But, but I, I need you to understand, before the church people and the world become so critical to judge, sometimes people are just trying to be fed. Now, I'm not saying that's the way to do it, but the reality is that's what people are looking for something in return. Why, why do you think they sometimes go to sources like drugs and alcohol because they're trying to find something in return. They're, they're, they're looking. Why do you think people go to other sources? Listen, our children, we've learned that, that the gangs, the way that they recruit the children, because even in our city, killings are being done by younger people. Do you know why these kids are being engrafted into these gangs? Because they're looking for acceptance. They're looking for something that they're not getting. They're not getting at home. They're not getting at school. They're not getting in their neighborhoods. They're not getting at church. And so the gang says, come over here and we'll be your family. We'll be loyal to you. We'll hold you down. Famine makes you do desperate things. But I got good news for you because chapter number seven opens up with the prophet saying, hear the word of the Lord tomorrow things, glory to God, are going to be different. I want to quickly prophesy to you today. I want you to hear me in the Holy Ghost. Tomorrow, there's getting ready to be a turnaround. Now, tomorrow could be 24 hours. Tomorrow could be the next season. But I want to prophesy, I am crazy enough to believe that by this time tomorrow, Glory shy. Hallelujah. I want, to, I want to prophesy to somebody that by this time tomorrow, there's getting ready to be a turnaround. By this time tomorrow, God's getting ready to shift some things. By this time tomorrow, God's getting ready to open up some things. By this time tomorrow, I don't know how many of you are listening, but I pray somebody catches it in their spirit. By this time tomorrow. I dare you put, put it in the comments. By this time tomorrow, God's getting ready to do something. God's getting ready to turn something. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the sun is going to come out tomorrow. Bet your bottom dollar that tomorrow there'll be sun. Listen, it's going to be great. It's, it's, it's going to be great. We can, we can get ready to sing and shout and dance because tomorrow is coming. I, I, I want to just encourage somebody to tell you tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming. That, 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 the, the movie uh, uh, Cast Away with Tom Hanks, uh, one, one of the things that stuck out to me the most is while he was on that island and, you know, he had, had his little ball um, and, and it was so interesting because he would talk to the ball and, and he would talk to himself and, and when they rescued him, they asked him the question. They said, how did you make it? He said, I kept telling myself that there was a tomorrow, that the sun was going to shine again. He kept reminding himself that there was another day. I want to encourage somebody who feels hopeless. I want to encourage somebody who's ready to give up. You're ready to commit suicide. I rebuke the spirit of suicide even now. I feel you, but I rebuke it. You got to get this. You got to hear me. There is tomorrow. Today is not it. Today is not the finality. It's not done today. There is a tomorrow. Tomorrow's coming. Tomorrow's coming. 
Tomorrow's coming. I, I, I just want to keep saying it. Tomorrow's coming. I'm, I'm getting ready to move, but tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming. The prophet said, by this time tomorrow, glory to God, by this time tomorrow, I, I'm going to preach till I prophesy to my own self, by this time tomorrow, tomorrow's coming. Tomorrow, I feel like a, the, the newsboy making an announcement, extra, extra, read all about it. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow, Shia, glory to God. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow is coming. Tomorrow, tomorrow. It's going to get better tomorrow. Things are going to change tomorrow. Things are going to be fixed tomorrow. The prophet said we're going to have some food tomorrow. Now, you always have the critics say, man, how is this going to happen? The prophet said, listen, because you doubt it, you're going to see it, but you're not going to enjoy it. Watch, watch. Listen, don't, don't, don't. Just because you don't feel it, just because you don't see it, just because you don't believe it, don't speak against it. This man could not enjoy it because he talked too much. He, 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 he didn't believe, but he talked too much. Don't voice, don't give voice to your unbelief. Don't give voice to your doubt. Don't give voice to your fear. Don't give voice to your pessimism. Don't give voice to your negativity. You might feel it, but shut your mouth. I didn't want to be rude and just tell you, shut up. That's how I feel. Because sometimes we talk ourselves out of stuff. He said, because this attitude, you're going to see it, but you're not going to enjoy it. Hey, Shana Mahaya, glory to God. Hallelujah, I feel the presence of God. Tomorrow's coming, tomorrow's coming, tomorrow, tomorrow's coming, tomorrow's coming. T tell somebody one more time in the comments, tomorrow's coming, tomorrow, tomorrow's coming. I, I know today feels like hell and problems and challenges and pain and disappointments and sickness and letdown and, and brokenness, but tomorrow's coming, tomorrow's coming. You got to start telling yourself today, tomorrow's coming, tomorrow's coming. I got I to gotta keep going, tomorrow's coming. I got to keep Fighting. Tomorrow's coming. I got to keep living. Tomorrow is coming. I, I want to hasten on, but I, but I need you to catch this. Tomorrow's coming. But here's the catch. The outcome was food was found. Everything the prophet spoke was real. Here's the question. I hear you, preacher. Tomorrow's coming, but the question is, how do I make it from today to tomorrow? Because when we finish shouting tomorrow's coming and get happy, the reality is now I, I got to live till tomorrow. How do I live today until tomorrow comes? Can I tell you something? And, and this is where I want to hasten on. The reality is, everybody, please hear me. The outcome is food was found. The famine was over within 24 hours. But I need to be honest with you. My focus today is not so much on the outcome, but the process to get to the outcome of tomorrow. I, I'm, I'm going to say something. I'm going to say something. The four lepers that we read about, because of their actions, the Bible says they're sitting outside the gate, they make a decision. They, they go to the enemy's camp. And the Bible says that God gets with the leopards. And as they're walking, the Bible says God gets with their steps. That by the time they got to the enemy, the enemy thought they heard an army when it was only four people, eight legs. But when God gets in what you do, it becomes magnified. The Bible says that the enemy ran, the Syrians ran. And left everything, food, horses, all kinds of stuff, resources, money, clothes, they left it all. Glory to God. I, I'm going to tell you that, that in the name of Jesus, you do have victory. In the name of Jesus, demons have to flee. Tell me who can stand before us when we call on that great name, Jesus. Jesus, precious, glory to God, precious Jesus, we eh, have the victory. God uses the leopards. So we know the end of the story. God uses the leopards. But this is the part that I need you to get. Y'all ready for this? Because I know we're ready to shout. I know if we're in church right now, we'd be dancing. But here's the part, glory to God. Here's the part that I need you to get. Here's the part I need you to get. 
They start out as leopards, but the story ends with them still being leopards. Ah, here's where we add tension. This message today is not about healing. Ooh, ooh. I, I, I know. I, I, when, I, when I heard that myself, I had to kind of step back because we, we believe healing is the children's bread. By his stripes, we were healed. I believe all of that. But sometimes and some situations, the status of where you are doesn't change. So I, I want to say this. Victory was received, but I need you to hear this. Victory is subjective. Victory looks different for different people. So what may be victory for you may not be victory for me, and what may be victory for me may not be victory for the next person. So I want to ask you this question. What does victory look like for you? You have to define victory. Okay, y'all, y'all missed it. You, you have to define victory. For the, the people of Israel, victory was getting food. Not the defeat of the enemy. It was getting food. Even though the enemy was defeated and they were able to get the food, but victory for the people in the city was getting food. Victory for the leopards was living <laughs> they, they wanted something to eat, but victory for the leopards was living. Because if you look at the text, what you will find out is they were sitting at the gate and they asked an important question. Why sit we here and die? I want to talk to somebody today. Lord have mercy. I'm, I'm going to get into my points because I'm going to run through this and I want to let you go. But I want to talk to somebody today. Number one, you have to define what victory is for you. Number two, you got to understand this. Sometimes God will not change the condition of you in order to have victory. Isn't it interesting that the king questions the integrity, the accuracy, and the loyalty of the report of victory through supply because of the condition of the ones that was reporting the victory? Because it was the leopards, he thought that they were being tricked. Because they were the leopards sitting outside the gate, he thought they were influenced by the enemy. I need you to hear me today, and I want you to hear me. Sometimes people judge you by your condition, and they let your condition become the thing that drives whether they listen to you or not. They, they let your condition become the thing that determines how they respond, but you can miss a miracle Judging and looking on somebody based upon their condition. Their condition doesn't change, but their status does. They brought victory to a city as leopards, which tells me that God can use me even with my dysfunctional condition. See, see, we can talk about the leprosy and we can get into it. Some people liken it unto AIDS and, and, and some people liken it to other a, a diseases. And the reality is um, um, leopards, um, they, they, it was a contagious disease. And depending on the severity of your leprosy, it depending on how they dealt with you. See, some people had a, a bout with leprosy and after seven days or so, they were able to get rid of it. And they had to go show themselves to the priest and the priest had to deem them healed. But then there were severe cases. They put those people outside the gate. See, see, leprosy could start off small, but it could end with decapitation of limbs. It could, it could end with becoming numb, sores in the mouth. It, it, could, it could be various things. Lord have, Lord, have mercy. I feel the power of God. But I need you to get this. This is not about their condition. It's about their decision. My first point is about your decision. I need you to get this. Make a decision. That's my first point. Make a decision. I'm, I'm hastening on. Make a decision. Now, now, here's what I need you to understand. It was as simple as a decision. 
When they made a decision, they went into action, things happened, God responded. Victory was brought to a city because of a decision. I need you to hear me. You are one decision away from a turnaround. You are one decision away from a breakthrough. You are one decision away from healing. You are one decision from one of the greatest opportunities of your life. You are one decision away. But y'all know me. We got to look a little bit deeper into this. Because what I found out is sometimes to make a decision is a lot harder than we think. Not because you're indecisive, but to make a decision means I have to sift through mental weeds. I, I got to sift through the weed of the reality of what is. They were lepers outside of the gates of the city. They weren't even allowed in the city. See, it's one thing when I'm in a famine, when I'm in a situation, when I'm in trouble, and I'm in the context of others. I have a support system, but it's something different when I'm isolated. They were outside the gates of the city. The city was closed off to them. Resources were closed off to them because of their condition. And then secondarily, their condition had the propensity to worsen. I, I told you that, that, that numbness could happen and limbs could fall off. And even more, death. Some of you that are listening to me this morning, you feel like leopards. You feel outside the gates. You, you're dealing with a decapitating, debilitating restrictive condition, whether it's hurt, pain, abuse, whether it's divorce, sickness, cancer, whatever it might be, financial struggles, whatever it might be, it's a debilitating, and the reality is it has the propensity to get worse and ultimately to take you out. Weeds of the thoughts of social pressure how do, will people respond? What do people think about me? Weeds of thoughts of hopelessness. For them to ask the question, why sit we here and die, meant they understood that death was inevitable. Y'all don't want to be real. Y'all don't got quiet now because, because you, you, you don't want to deal with this reality. The reality is... To make a decision means I have to process and filter through the weeds. And truth be told, I felt hopeless. I know I've wanted to die. I've wanted to quit. I wanted to be like Elijah and say, I'm going to sit under this juniper tree and I just want to die. No, no, no. I, I know what it feels like. To say, I just want to die. I, don't, I just want to be rid of it all. I just want to quit. I don't want to keep doing this. I just want out. I don't want to preach anymore. I don't want to pastor anymore. I don't want to be CEO anymore. I don't want to work anymore. I don't want to be husband and wife anymore. I, I don't want to do this anymore. I know what it's like to be at the point where you just want to quit, where you just want to give up, where you just feel hopeless. What's the point? Why am I putting all this effort into it? Why am I dealing with these kids? And, and they keep doing the same thing. Why, why am I trying to teach the children and they seem like they won't learn? Why am I trying to invest in the community and it seems like it won't get better? Why am I praying and it seems like God won't respond? Why am I giving? and it seemed like the money is not working? Why am I trying to be healthy going to the gym and it seemed like I'm still getting sick? Why are we doing what we're doing and children are still dying? Why are we doing what we're doing? We're still dealing with racism and all kinds of other issues. The reality is sometimes, glory to God, you feel hopeless. And you got to weed through that. They're outside the gate which implies the severity of their situation. How do you push past the thoughts of doom? I I'm doomed if I do. I'm doomed if I don't. You know, that's not what they say, but some of y'all would think I was cussing if I said it the real way. But the reality is, however it is, it it's, it's like, how do you push past that? What happens when you lose vision? 
Because you could be so caught up in your situation and the weeds can grow so high that you can't see anymore. You, you, see, see, some of you, I know you're deep and you never go through anything and it's just always peachy cream and your life is always, but, but there are moments where the weeds can grow so high in your mind, the mental weeds can grow so high where you can't see future, where you don't even believe that anything can get better. You don't even see next month. You don't see next week because in your mind, this is all that there is. Hmm. things can can become so overwhelming and discouraging that you lose vision of the future where there is no vision people perish i'm hastening on but where there's no vision people perish and and i gotta push past all of this to make a decision why sit we here and die Something in them would not let them settle. Hey, Tamasha, I want to talk to somebody today, and I want to say to you that if nothing else, this word, I believe, is going to stir up the inner man in you that won't let you settle. I want you to hear my voice saying, fight, 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 fight. Something in them would not let them settle. And the Bible says that they would in themselves says, why sit we here and die? I know we're in bad circumstances. I know we're leopards. I know it looks bad. I know what the end result is. But why sit we here and die? Let's make a decision. Fight back. I decided to fight. Fight back. We don't have to sit and take this sitting down. People, I need you to hear me. As a community, we put these people in office. They are elected officials. We don't have to sit and take this. Sign up. Register to vote. When it's time for voting in, in the, 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 the preliminary and the primary, go to the poll. I don't care if they try to redistrict. I don't care if they try to put restrictions in. Do what they say. File them. Get your IDs together and let's hit the polls. There is something that we can do. Make a decision. Second thing, you always have a choice. You always have a choice. I know I've been there. I don't always feel like there's a choice, but really, you always have a choice. They said, listen, we can sit here and die. Listen, the text, read it. They said, we stay here, we're going to die. We're going to the city, we're going to die. Let's let's choose the option that may seem the riskiest, but will have the greatest return. You'll never make money being scared. Sometimes you have to take a risk. You always have a choice. I know it may not be the best, most viable choice, but you always have a choice. See, the way... The enemy gets you with suicide, depression. The way the enemy gets people to give up, cower, buckle under pressure is when he puts your back up against the wall and make you feel like you have no other option. I've been there. Oh, no, no, no. I'm preaching from from experience. I know what it feels like to feel like your back is up against the wall and, and, and you don't have any more options. I know what it's like to feel like you're a rat caught in a trap and there's no way out and you just feel like you give up. But even a rat has sense enough that if you back him up in a corner, he's going to fight his way out. They said, we have a choice. They said, we're going to go to the enemy camp. Because they said, the worst thing that can happen is we're going to (laughs) die. See, if we stay here, we're going to die. If we're going to the city, we're going to die. But if we go to the enemy, if anything wrong goes, or if anything goes wrong, the worst thing that's going to happen is we're going to die. <laughs> y- y'all to get after a while. See, see, they said, at least we can try. I was taught nothing beats a failure but a try. A- at least they tried. You know what I found out? Sometimes people with the most mouth... Sometimes the critics, people that do, sometimes they won't even do anything. They won't even lift a hand to help. They, they'll, they'll talk about 
society. They'll talk about your family. They'll talk about your marriage. They'll talk about ministry. They'll, they'll talk about things, but they won't do anything. They'll talk about the politicians, but they won't go vote. They'll, they'll, they'll talk about you, but they won't offer a helping hand. Y'all, y'all don't got quiet now because some of y'all are guilty of doing a whole lot of conversation, but you won't even try. The Bible says they made a decision. We're going to go to the enemy's camp. And then my third point, and they arose. See, I've already told you how the story goes. I've already told you that God got in their footsteps. And I can go back and preach that, and we can do all that. But I I need y'all to hear me. There's a principle that I'm after today that's more than you just shouting and dancing. I need you to hear me. You have to get up. You have to get up. There's a, 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 a woman, and she has a book about giving yourself high five. <laughs> oh, there's, there's, she was on, on, on today's show. And uh, it was interesting because she was dealing with the concept that giving yourself a high five in the mirror causes endorphins to be released. It, it creates a mindset that helps you to overcome negativity and, de- and depression and it puts you in a better mood. It, it's, it's, it's so interesting that doing that can create a different mindset, a different mentality. And if you do it consistently, you can break the pattern of depression and negativity. This is, this is what, what her book suggests. Getting up represents changing of position. I'm about to close now. Getting up represents the changing of position. I I want you to get this. With that high five example, the one that is what they call a neurobic exercise, that which has to deal with the brain. (laughs) It it has to deal with brain activity. I I want you to get it. Get this. It, It causes the activation of your senses and stimulates through this exercise. Why is this so important? I need you to get this. It causes a different attitude, a different headspace. As I wrap this up today, I want to challenge somebody that you got to give up. Get up. If you're dealing with depression, you got to get up. Open up the curtains. Go get some sun. Go for a walk. I, I, w- I was talking to my grandmother and, and my parents the other day, and, and I was telling them that or telling her she, she was out the house, I saw them, and I said to her, I'm so glad that you got out because if you don't use your limbs, you lose them. You, you gotta, you gotta, even, even the doctors tell you that you have to walk, you have to do it because if you don't exercise, you lose strength. Get up. I close by telling you this. You got to fight. These leopards fought back. They made a decision. Lord have mercy. I I feel the power of God helping somebody. And here's the last thing I want to tell you as I get ready to pray. Your fight is connected to others because you got to remember this. Prophecy came before the, the lepers made a decision. They said, by this time tomorrow, here's what you need to understand. They got up at twilight. They got up at dusk. It talks about 
when the wind blows. <laughs> they, they got up in, in, a, in, in, a, in a time where things are about to transition. They, they didn't move in the cloak of light. They moved at twilight. I, I wish I'm about to get this because sometimes you have to make a decision in the dark. Dark while you're depressed. Dark while you're hurting. Dark while you're broke. Dark while you're struggling. Dark while you're divorced. Dark while you're sick. Dark while you're going through. Dark when you feel alone. Dark. You, you got to make a decision in the dark. What do you just, I'm going to fight back. And here's what you don't know. Because they fought, they went down to the enemy's camp. The Bible says that, that, that they thought something was wrong at first because nobody was there. But when they went in this tent, they saw food. They saw clothes. They, saw, they went in the next tent, and they said, we can't keep this to ourselves. And they ran back and told the king, as I told you earlier. And when the day came, the next day, food was for the people. What would have happened if they never decided to fight. What if Rosa Parks had decided to stay and get up and move? Not to stay, but to get up and move. What would have happened if she allowed the pressure to make her quit. What would have happened if they didn't have the great boycott? What, what would have happened if Martin Luther King didn't push back? What would have happened if your ancestors, your mother and your father and your grandparents overcoming slavery, poverty, living without running water, what would have happened if they didn't fight back? What would have happened if Jesus had a succumbed, sequestered to what he was going through? I want to tell you today, you got more fight in you than what you think. It's time for you to fight back. Father, I thank you today for your presence, your power, your spirit. I thank you because it's in you we live and move and have our being. Today, Lord, thank you for fight. Thank you for fight. Hey, glory to God. Today, Father, I ask that you would give the grace and the courage to make decisions. Help us to be aware, to acknowledge, to know, to remember. We always have choices. And then help us to get up. Our fight is connected to others. People are depending on us even when we don't think they are. And despite our condition, we still matter. So today, Father, I thank you for fight. I thank you for the anointing to fight. In Jesus' name, amen. The city was saved by four leprous men. Just imagine who's going to be saved because of you. Jesus, a person hung on a cross, died, and because of him, we can be saved. If you have not accepted the Lord as your Savior, I want you to fight. I want you to fight. I want you to fight. How do I fight, preacher? How do I fight, James Nelson? You make a decision. Accept him into your life. Believe that you can be saved and confess with your mouth. Lord, I want to be saved. I, I don't really know all that I need to know how to do. I don't even really know how to do this, Lord, but I can't. I don't want to do it without you. I, I just want to live. Come into my life, Lord. Forgive me, save me. 
I, I know that you died and you were buried and you rose just for me, and I thank you. If you made the decision today, I want you to respond to that email. Put it in the comments. And I believe God's going to help you because we're going to tell you about baptism in Jesus' name. And you will be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Listen, before I go, I need to pray for you. I feel the pull today for those of you that are struggling. You're wrestling. You've lost your fight. Lord Jesus, I thank you today for every person that's listening that is acknowledging while they're listening that they need to get their fight back. They lost vision in the womb. Weeds of their mind, they don't feel hope, Father. Today, I stir up the fight in them. I come against and I bind every negative thought, every word that has been sown by the enemy. Today, Father, I thank you for fight. I thank you for fight. I thank you for fight. I thank you, Father, that you strengthen us enough to fight, that even if our condition don't change, we're going to live. We're not going to sit here and die. We're not going to sit here and take this. But I thank you today that life comes to the person that I'm talking to. I thank you that they get their swing back. I thank you that they get their movement back. I thank you that they get their stamina back. I thank you that they get their determination back. And I thank you that we fight today in Jesus' name. Listen, if you have just joined us, I know our time is up, but if you just joined us or you joined late, I want to give you an opportunity. So you are blessed by this word. I want you to help us fight. I want you to sow a fighting seed right now. I want you to sow a fighting seed. I want you to sow a fighting seed. It could be your age. It, it could be whatever. It could be the day of the week. I don't care what it is. It could be something that represents a number that, that's important to you. But I want you to sow a fighting seed right now. Sow a fighting seed. Everybody, right now, I want you to sow a fighting, fighting seed. I'm not going to take this sitting down. I am going to fight. Cash App, JM Ministries, Givelify, Destin Christian Church. Text to give, 34444, and put in the comments, give DCC. Sow a fighting seed right now. A fighting seed right now. We're gonna, I'm going to leave it up while, while I dismiss because I want you to sow while I'm talking. We're going home. I want to thank you for joining us. I know you're getting ready to go and enjoy your burgers and all that stuff, but I want you to fight. I want you to fight. Sow a seed. This is the seed that says, God, I'm going to fight. That's what this seed is saying. God, I'm going to fight. Listen, I love you with the love of Christ. I can't wait to see what God does. I'm looking to see you Saturday. We got Bible study on Thursday, the Lord be willing, but I need you to fight. I want you to enjoy your tomorrow, but I want you to fight because tomorrow's coming. I need you to fight today. Tomorrow's coming. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, lift up his countenance and give you peace in Jesus' name. Happy Memorial Day. We honor all of those that served, gave their lives. Fight. God bless you. You are here because there is a destiny on your life. You and I don't know what that destiny is, but you and I have a destiny. Now, God will reveal to us what that destiny is, but readily, just, just when you wake up in the morning, when you're just alive, you might not know what it is. So here's what God will do. Because your destiny is so important, he will not allow us to miss it. So what he will do is intentionally allow things to happen to lay hold on us to bring us to where he wants us to be.